this is Nicole Bouvier. I'm an associate professor of infectious diseases and microbiology. And I'm going to be talking about um, developing diagnostics and therapeutics in real time for emerging infectious diseases. Um, first, we can start by defining what we mean by emerging infectious diseases. Um, and then, of course, what's the difference between that and a re-emerging infectious disease. So, um, Commonly, emerging infectious diseases are defined um, by um, outbreaks of previous unknown diseases, and that would seem to describe uh, COVID-19, which is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2, um, which emerged uh, in the end of 2019 um, and is still uh, circulating in pandemic fashion. Um, and you know this was a, a virus and a disease that was sort of previously unknown, um, as was the original SARS, uh, which was ca caused by the SARS uh, coronavirus one um, back in 2003. Um, very different from the current COVID-19 epidemic, um, SARS did spread um, to other different parts of the world, but not quite as extensively as the SARS-CoV-2, um, and actually just seemed to uh, sort of die out of its own accord, um, which doesn't seem to be happening <laughs> with COVID at the moment. Um, you know, we tend to forget that emerging infectious diseases are constantly emerging. Things that we are used to now, like HIV, um, back in the early 80s were completely novel. Um, and we first recognized uh, AIDS as a clinical syndrome um, and identified HIV as the causative agent in the, in the 80s. But it's thought that actually there probably had been sporadic HIV infections before that, you know, maybe even up to 100 years before um, it was first uh, recognized as a uh, infectious disease. Um, and what was probably different um, previous to the 1980s is that there was a, a sort of um, social and demographic milieu in which HIV was uh, able to spread um, very rapidly um, in a way that it sort of hadn't been able to spread um, and become um, the sort of pandemic that we know today um, until then. So it was probably existing, it was just existing under the radar in a way that we didn't appreciate. Um, similar to that, Lyme disease, which is caused by a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi, um, was first recognized in 1975. It's actually an ancient disease. Um, there have been um, genomic studies suggesting that it's probably been in North America since before there were people in North America. Um, there was um, Borrelia DNA found in um, a, a uh, ice man, a uh, um, corpse of a, um, uh, a man that was probably dating from 5000 BC, um, traces of Borrelia DNA were found um, with that uh, um, ice man. So, you know, again, an ancient disease which was only first recognized fairly recently. And then there are the diseases that we know about, but they're changing in some way that is alarming. Um, either that they're increasing in incidence, um, spreading in terms of geographic range, or becoming um, harder to treat or more clinically um, uh, dangerous. And so things like Ebola, um, which had been occurring in very small outbreaks um, here and there since um, the 70s, um, the West African epidemic that occurred in 2014 was extremely different from the way Ebola had been presenting previously. Um, first, it was in a different place. Um, prior Ebola outbreaks had happened more in Central Africa, uh, whereas the 2014 epidemic was central, uh, centered really in West Africa, um, and it infected you know tens of thousands of people, which was very unusual um, when compared to prior Ebola outbreaks, which you know would infect maybe tens or hundreds of people at most. Um, so, you know, this was sort of um, a very unusual and alarming manifestation of a disease that we had already 
uh, come to know under different circumstances. Um, Zika virus uh, was first actually discovered in the 1940s. The first human case was identified in the 60s, and it sort of existed in, in a very under the radar fashion in Africa until it spread um, throughout Southeast Asia and started causing um, first neurologic syndromes, um, Guillain-Barre, which is an ascending paralysis, um, which was first appreciated in Micronesia in 2007. It then spread around the Pacific Islands um, and ended up in South America where um, it was first um, associated with congenital Zika syndrome um, with things like microcephaly um, in 2015. So, you know, again, a, a, an old disease that had suddenly not only increased its geographic range, but had appeared clinically different than we had appreciated previously. Um, then there's dengue, which is caused by four different serotypes of dengue virus. Um, it's been around since longer than 1789. I just put that date because that's when it was thought to be introduced to North America. And that's when it was first um, called breakbone fever, um, which is uh, sort of a, a reference to its, um, the uh, muscle and, and joint pain that occurs with dengue. Um, and, you know, that it was previously a pretty um, limited disease with limited outbreaks, but we've seen an exponential increase in incidence since about 1960. It just keeps um, getting higher and higher and higher. Um, and then there's also um, persistence of infectious diseases that cannot be controlled. And so cannot is sort of hard to define, but basically things like cholera, which um, used to be really restricted to uh, the Ganges River Delta, um, in the 1800s with expanded um, travel and trade um, caused many pandemics around the world and is still endemic in lots of parts of the world um, where uh, clean water and sanitation is problematic. So places where, you know, like the United States, we don't have cholera anymore and we know how to get rid of cholera. It's just um, in certain parts of the world, what you need to do is difficult to do. Um, so then there are the re-emerging re infectious diseases, and those are defined as uh, diseases that sort of come and go um, for many reasons, such as breakdowns in public health infrastructure. So, you know, we already mentioned cholera, but something like pertussis, which is a vaccine preventable disease, but because the vaccine is not um, lifelong, you need boosters, and because of vaccine hesitancy, we've, we're starting to see pertussis reemerge as, um, uh, you know, far more common than it used to be, more in the Western United States than in the Eastern United States. But, um, you know, what we thought was a vaccine, if not eradicated disease, at least vaccine control disease, is um, uh, not as controlled as we thought it was. There are also new strains of known microorganisms, usually some sort of genetic mutation that um, renders it uh, a little bit different. So pandemic influenza is, is an example. So we know influenza, it's just periodically um, there will be emergence of viruses that have either um, all or part of their genome from an animal virus that the human population is not immune to, um, and it causes a pandemic, such as in the most recent pandemic of 2009. Uh, e. coli 0157H7, which is associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, which is a kidney disease, um, is probably descended from a relatively non-pathogenic E. coli bacterium, um, and it acquired some virulence factors that make it um, much more um, harmful to people than its uh, ancestor was. And then there are things like multi drug resistant organisms like tuberculosis and Neisseria gonorrhea, which have taken um, fairly treatable diseases and made them a little bit harder to treat. Um, and hopefully they will not go into the untreatable range. Um, there's a lot of uh, human encroachment on isolated animal habitats. So zoonoses, which are um, animal diseases that jump into humans because they are compatible with humans, but don't normally, aren't 
normally found in humans um, are becoming more and more common as humans get closer and closer to um, animals that they used to not come in contact with. Um, Nipah virus is found in um, Indonesia and uh, Southeast Asia. Um, it's carried by bats. Um, and Nipah virus was unknown before, you know, about 20 years ago. Um, it's only when people started getting close to bats um, that this um, zoonosis, this crossover from bats to humans was allowed to occur. And it's thought that COVID-19, that SARS-CoV-2 may have also originated from a bat virus um, that possibly passed through an intermediate host, but um, uh, passed into humans because the, the barrier between a lot of animal habitats and human habitats aren't quite as um, uh, firmly drawn as they once were. Um, human demographics and behavior changes. Um, dengue is known as an urban disease, really, because humans are um, very important in its in the virus's life cycle. Um, so, if uh, there aren't humans with dengue virus in their blood to bite, then mosquitoes never pick it up. So, mosquitoes get it from humans and then give it to other humans. So, if there aren't humans around with dengue, dengue doesn't transmit. Um, so part of the reason that it's thought that we've seen such an increase in dengue is because um, people are just, there's more people around and the world is more populated and um, it's easier for mosquitoes to find people to help amplify the virus. Um, and then there's climate change, which for a lot of arboviruses, which are um, arthropod-borne viruses, um, like chikungunya, dengue, and West Nile virus, um, climate change is allowing uh, previously restricted mosquito habitats um, that were restricted to the tropics are starting to get broader and broader um, into more temperate climates. And obviously, um, if the mosquito populations um, uh, increase their range, then the diseases they carry will increase the range as well. So um, Joshua Lederberg, who was a bacterial geneticist, a Nobel Prize winner, um, I would recommend reading this um, short article called Infectious History, which was published in Science. It's sort of a um, a thought piece on um, emerging infectious diseases and what they mean and, and what to do about them. But um, what he said was that the future of microbes and mankind will probably unfold as episodes of a suspense thriller that could be entitled Our Wits Versus Their Genes. Uh, and we tend to think of um, the sort of um, interplay between humans and microbes is a war. You know, we talk about um, waging war on these organisms. And Lederberg actually recommended thinking of them more as a sort of ecological balance um, for many reasons, um, mostly because it's probably a war that we won't win. Um, they outnumber us by a lot. I mean, there are way more microbial species than there are um, us. Um, we need some of them. Um, Letterberg called them our home team microbes. So those are the bacteria that live in your gut that help you digest your food. They're bacteria who um, help you maintain homeostasis in very various parts of your body. I mean, we have evolved over millennia to accommodate bacteria and even to use them to our advantage. Um, and when you take a broad spectrum antibiotic, you're actually killing some of these microbes that we've evolved to depend on. Um, and that's not always um, something that, that is easily recovered from. And they also evolve way faster than us. So, you know, the generation time of a human is maybe like 20 years between generations. Um, the generation time of E. coli is more like 20 minutes. So the sort of random mutation and, and uh, natural selection um, that, uh, you know, allows us to evolve, it happens in bacteria and viruses and fungi way faster. So we could never evolve fast enough to keep up with their evolution. And, you know, the only sort of thing that we have on our side of the equation is that we have big brains. And so we can try to, um, you know, think our way out of um, bad interactions with microbes. But um, I think, you know, part of what we need to think about doing is living with them rather than living in opposition with them. 
um, and so what do we need to do to respond in real time to emerging infectious diseases? Um, we need surveillance and research, and it's um, a little odd to talk about, you know, research and surveillance in terms of a brand new emerging infectious disease because you think of it as something new that we didn't know was there. But a lot of um, animal surveillance and research can actually help deal with an emerging infectious disease because you may have already um, studied either that microbe or similar ones that help us um, to figure out what to do with the new one. Um, one of the important questions in terms of surveillance and research is, you know, logistically and financially, how, you know, are we able to keep tabs on pathogens with pandemic potential? You know, can we um, surveil bats to figure out all the different kinds of coronaviruses that they're infected with? Um, how much does that cost and what are we willing to um, put into that effort as, um, as a species so that we can develop the knowledge base to deal with pathogens that do um, emerge into epidemics or pandemics. Um, we need diagnostic tests, and that's for, you know, medical and epidemiological concerns. I mean, you, you have to know who's infected and who isn't, and these tests have to be reliable. They have to um, have a pretty good ability to distinguish between people who are infected and people who aren't. Um, there are scientific concerns, like things like how hard is this test to do? Is it something that um, you know, your average lab tech can do or does it require specialized um, knowledge? And you know, the harder a test to do is, is to do, the less likely it is to get incorporated into sort of routine clinical care. Um, and there are regulatory concerns. You, know, you can't just um, build your own test and start using it. Um, you have to ha be able to show that it works and to validate the test in a way that um, will appease regulatory authorities so that they're aware of what you're doing and they think that um, the test is accurate enough and that your ability to do it is uh, reproducible enough that it can be relied upon for, for clinical use. Um, there are therapeutics. Um, lots of ethical concerns about therapeutics. Who gets it? Um, and that's partly in terms of um, things that are in limited supply. Um, you know, how do you choose um, which of the many thousands of people are infected with a, an emerging infectious disease to give a limited supply of a therapeutic to? And then there's also the ethical uh, considerations about doing randomized controlled trials. You know, we don't always know that therapeutics work until we do a randomized control trial. But when you do that, you're essentially putting part of the patient group on a placebo. You're not giving them the active drug. Um, and what are the ethics of that in, a, in an emerging infectious disease in a pandemic where there may not be other things available to treat patients? Um, you know, consider how, who is actually making the therapeutics. I mean, nature is a wonderful manufacturer. Nature makes antibodies and all kinds of uh, responses to um, infectious diseases. And I think we can learn a lot from nature and use, um, you know, the ability of nature to respond to um, new diseases. For instance, I think the, um, the Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody that's in clinical trials right now um, was found um, with a, using a B-cell screen of a patient who had been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and they found a, an antibody that was, you know, broadly, you know, um, neutralizing for the virus. And, you know, the, the, it's now made recombinantly, but it originally came from a human being who made it um, in response to this disease. Um, so can we leverage um, nature's ability to do things um, faster and better than we can? Um, and what about repurposing existing therapies? I mean, this gets back to um, what do we know about this microorganism? Like, do we know anything about it? Can we draw parallels to um, a different organism, for instance, like the original SARS? And does that give us any information about what kinds of therapeutics we might be able to try, things like steroids, um, 
or other drugs that you know may have worked for similar um, infections. And then there's also vaccines, um, which you know real time in the world of vaccinology is is very different from real time in the real world. I mean, vaccines take a lot of time. Um, the just the effort it takes to vaccinate tens of thousands of people with active vaccine versus placebo and then sitting around and waiting for them to either get infected or not infected there's just no way to speed that process up i mean short of intentionally infecting people with the pathogen so you know these are things that um you know as fast as we'd like to make vaccines they the the process just can only be sped up by a certain amount. Um, and then there's also different arms of the immune system and different pathogens um, elicit stronger responses from um, one arm versus the other. And we know, for instance, um, you know, antibodies are great for preventing influenza. So that's a, a humoral response. Um, you know, we want our vaccines against flu to engage, um, you know, B cells to create antibodies. But a bacterium like tuberculosis doesn't care about antibodies. Antibodies don't bother TB a bit. You know, our only um, defense against TB is uh, cell-mediated responses like T cells. So, you know, again, it, it sort of harkens back to what do we know about this organism? Like, how do you design the optimal vaccine when you're not even sure um, what the um, what the immune response is and how we need to engage it with a vaccine platform. So there's lots of, um, you know, concerns that could be addressed in very creative ways, but it's a very complex problem. Um, and, you know, that's been obviously highlighted by COVID-19, um, which I think, uh, you know, we knew about it before it hit New York City, but it hit New York City pretty early relative to the rest of the United States, and it hit New York really hard. I mean, I think we were expecting um, maybe to be a little bit more like Seattle, where we had cases here and there that were travel associated, and we were able to isolate them. Um, and it turns out instead, we got multiple introductions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus from Europe, mostly. Um, so multiple people brought it in and introduced it into the New York City population in a really um, sort of silent way. We didn't know that it was even here. It was circulating before um, the first people started getting sick in a way that could be recognized as COVID-19. Um, and so I think, you know, we were sort of caught a little bit off guard. Um, it didn't happen the way we sort of expected it to, and it happened in a really bad way. Um, this is a map from, I think it was from June, if I recall, but, uh, you know, looking at um, the cases per 100,000 people, I mean, there really was not a place in New York City that was spared, um, and there were places that were hit really hard, like the Bronx um, and Queens, um, you know, less so in Manhattan, for example, but, you know, really it didn't spare any part of the city. Um, this is a graph of our hospitalizations from the past spring. These are all COVID hospitalizations by day. Um, I would like to point out that Mount Sinai is an 1100 bed hospital. So we were, you know, that's our nominal bed capacity. Obviously, there are places like, um, you know, post anesthesia care units and outpatient clinics and things that we don't count as, you know, normal beds. But, you know, we were sort of almost double our nominal capacity for about a solid month. And, you know, what do you do when patients are um, just everywhere. Well, you put them everywhere you can. You put them in lobbies and you put them in tents in Central Park. And, um, you know, we we sort of muddled through with this, but I mean, it was, the strain on resources and hospitals was, I think, you know, unprecedented in modern times. Um, and really, I think we have to think very hard about what happened to us and how um, to make it not happen again.
So the project that I was mostly involved with in was convalescent plasma program. And so what is convalescent plasma? Plasma is basically the liquid part of blood. Um, it contains um, proteins like antibodies, but also other blood proteins like albumin, um, coagulation factors, salts, fats. It's basically everything except the cells. So the white blood cells, the red blood cells are centrifuged off and it's what, ev what everything that's left. And so the idea is that people who have recovered from a disease will have started making antibodies against that disease. And those antibodies will be found in their plasma. So a, a person who's recovered from the disease can donate blood. The plasma is um, collected from it and then can be infused into people who are actually sick at that moment with the disease um, and who haven't sort of had a chance to um, mount their own antibody response um, that by giving them a transfusion of someone else's antibodies that it may help um, patients get better faster. Um, at Mount Sinai, we um, basically recovered convalescent plasma from people, COVID-19 recovered blood donors. And if you recall the epidemic curve, I mean, it went up so sharply so fast that we had tons of patients before we had enough donors who had recovered from COVID and had been recovered for long enough to have mounted an optimal antibody response. Um, so we had to wait until we were about three, four weeks into the epidemic before we even started having optimal um, blood donors. And, you know, at the same time, we were just accumulating patients, more and more patients um, that we had nothing to treat. But eventually we were able to start um, finding donors and the way that we found them was through a, a homebrew assay. So um, we are fortunate um, to have Florian Kramer here at Mount Sinai who's really a sort of um, Jedi master of proteins um, who can sort of make any protein you want um, and you know develop uh, immunological assays to um, understand whether uh, you know, your antibodies will recognize that protein or not. Um, so this was a two-step assay that was both qualitative. So there's a, um, a yes, no step, like positive or negative. If you test positive, um, your serum is then um, titrated in, in dilutions to see how far you can dilute it before you lose the ability to recognize a protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the more you can dilute it, that means the more antibodies you have in, in the serum that are re, uh, recognizing the, the viral protein. And, um, you know, along with the sort of regulatory issues, uh, we couldn't just start using this assay, you know, willy-nilly. It actually had to be um, studied and validated and then approved by the FDA before uh, we were actually allowed to use it on patients. Um, donors were solicited by media outreach, and I have to say the response was really wonderful. Um, you know, New York really turned out in um, efforts to help others, um, and you know, patients who tested with a high antibody amount were referred to donate their blood. Um, so I was sort of working on the other end of the program. That's giving the plasma to recipients. Um, we started under a sort of pathway that the FDA has for giving experimental drugs. Um, I started working on this project on the 24th of March and we transfused our first patient on the 28th of March. So that was kind of crazy. Um, so that was then. Um, plasma has to be matched by blood type. Um, it's kind of the opposite of, of red blood cells, so you know where universal donor is O and universal recipient is AB for blood um, donations. It's opposite for plasma because you're talking about antibodies rather than the cells. Um, so you have to be able to you know, you know, match the person's blood type with the recipient. Um, so uh, we did that for a little while and then the FDA opened what's called an expanded access program and that's a sort of um, it's similar to the investigational new drug pathway, um, except it's run by a single institution and you don't have to apply for each and every patient that you want to treat. You can um, treat patients under this larger umbrella um, that in, in this case was being run by Mayo Clinic. 
Um, so uh, we expanded to the entire Mount Sinai Health System by April 15th. Um, we reached our 200th transfusion in late April, 300 by early May, and 400 by mid-May. Um, and we're about at, I think, 480 right now, um, because obviously, as you can see, the pandemic here really tailed off, and we have fortunately, knock wood, um, not seen um, anything like the numbers that we saw in the spring. So the first analysis that we did of this is looking at the 39 patients who were transfused under the EIND process um, between the 24th of March and the 8th of April. So they were by and large middle age. Um, overall, we transfused everyone from the age of 18 up to I think 96 was our oldest patient. Um, it was about two thirds male and one third female, which is typical of the um, uh, sex proportions of serious COVID disease. I think the infection ratio is closer to one to one, um, but men get worse disease and die at higher rates than women. We tried to um, get people early in disease because um, when you think about it, if, if the idea is that the antibodies in the plasma are exerting an antiviral effect, meaning that they're preventing the virus from replicating, you have to get the treatment into the patient pretty quickly because the virus is only replicating for a little while, you know, days to weeks. Um, and after that, the problems that are caused are mostly the immune response to the virus and not the virus itself. So, you know, if you don't get the antiviral into the patient when the virus is still replicating, then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So our goal was to get people as quickly as possible. Um, and we you know, managed to get a lot of people you know, the minute they stepped into the hospital. Um, most of our patients were on high, some sort of high flow oxygen. Um, so you know, we were focusing on people who were doing poorly but hadn't quite um, gotten so sick that they were on a ventilator. Um, and at the same time, we were trying not to transfuse too many people who um, maybe would have just gotten better by themselves. Um, and then we compared them to controls, which were drawn from the COVID positive um, patient population admitted during the same time frame. Um, and, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, because plasma supply was very limited early on, we had a lot more patients who were untreated than who were treated, um, which gave us a sort of large pool to draw controls from. And so um, we analyzed the the data into the logistic regression trying to identify factors that predicted whether a patient was going to be treated with plasma or not. And then what we did is we took patients who were untreated and found patients that had this exact same propensity for treatment, but just weren't um, because of limited supply um, and matched those in one to four and one to two ratios to all of the patients who were treated with um, plasma. And we were able to enforce exact matching on a lot of important um, parameters that determine whether or not a patient needed to be treated with plasma or not. And you know, we ended up getting really good um, balance in our control group and our plasma group in terms of you know what what they looked like, what their clinical characteristics were, um, except for being treated with plasma or not. And what we found is that um, after adjusting for covariates that we couldn't put into the original um, algorithm because they weren't easily accessible from the database, we had to sort of um, once we did the matching, we had to retrospectively go back and look at the controls um, and identify things like duration of symptoms and other drugs that they were administered. But what we found is a, a small but statistically significant uh, benefit in survival probability. Um, and looking at the hazard ratio for in-hospital in mortality, um, and again, adjusting for the things that um, we couldn't um, put into the matching algorithm from the start, um, what we found is that in the one to four matched cohort in, a, in two different ways of analyzing it, both were statistically significantly um, better for plasma recipients. Uh, the one to two cohort, um, the confidence interval crossed um, uh, one because it's a smaller 
group, so the power is reduced. Um, but it appears that, um, you know, at least with this retrospective analysis that um, plasma recipients did better than very similar patients who did not receive plasma. So the caveats are, of course, that it's retrospective. It's a single center study. Um, and I think an important caveat is that because New York was so early on, um, we actually didn't know how best to treat people when we were treating them. So we had some information from China and some information from Italy and other places that were hit hard before us. But really, um, you know, there was just a lot we didn't know about this disease. Um, and so, you know, for instance, I think our mortality rates are much worse than they are right now. And that's just because we've learned as we've gone along um, how to best treat this disease. It is not a randomized controlled trial, um, so that's a big caveat. And it's a small group, so not every outcome we looked at was statistically significant. We are trying to look at the larger group right now, but that has its own sort of biostatistical complications. I think the strengths are is that um, because we treated such a small amount of patients compared to the number of patients we had, we had a really um, diverse um, patient pool to choose controls from. So we were able to choose controls that were really pretty good clones of the, the treated recipients. Um, the propensity score algorithm was really pretty um, robust in terms of the um, data that it was looking at um, to match controls to cases. Um, and because we uh, the Kramer lab assay was so quickly deployed clinically in the clinical lab, we were able to screen our plasma donors before we even sent them for um, plasmapheresis. So unlike a lot of places which were just taking donations from um, patients who had recovered but didn't really know what their titers were, we were able to prioritize people that we knew had the highest titers um, to start with. So the conclusions were a suggestion of modest clinical effectiveness when added to standard of care. Um, there was a suggestion which was not statistically significant, but a trend towards greater benefit when given early in disease um, before patients got too sick. Um, and that, again, that sort of makes sense with the mechanism of action that it's um, trying to uh, curtail viral replication. Um, and once immunopathology sets in, that's not something that plasma can probably fix or antibodies can fix. Um, and certainly we do need randomized trials to confirm e efficacy because you, know, you can do the best um, controlled, you know, retrospective non-randomized study in the world and still find something different in a randomized controlled trial. Um, and so Cochrane Review, of course, is, you know, the, the um, big granddaddy of evidence-based medicine. So they're periodically uh, revising their um, uh, summary of convalescent plasma. Um, they still are saying that the effectiveness and safety of convalescent plasma is uncertain. And that's largely because of the quality of data. Um, there's only one randomized control trial that they were able to include. And that trial actually um, did not fully enroll because it was a Chinese trial and the, the epidemic in Wuhan um, had basically disappeared by the time that they were able to implement this trial. And that's been seen in a couple of places that by the time you do all the paperwork required to run a clinical trial, the virus is gone. Um, that's happened to hospitals in New York, um, for example. Um, they identified a bunch of ongoing studies, including 50 randomized trials. So, you know, ideally there's data coming um, in randomized trials, but getting back to sort of how do you decide who to treat? Um, when convalescent plasma um, is sort of freely available because the FDA has made it relatively freely available, I mean, it's still not FDA approved, so you have to get informed consent from patients and um, so on and so forth, but, you know, it's relatively freely available for a uh, non-approved um, investigational agent. When you have something like that that's pretty freely available, you know, what, what are people's incentive to go into a randomized controlled trial where they have a 50% chance of getting a placebo? Um, so, you know, I think 
the, the availability of plasma, while it may be good for the people who were treated and they may have done better than they would have done otherwise, is actually harming our ability to do the sort of gold standard studies that would um, enable us to know for sure whether this therapy is actually working. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's a complicated issue with an emerging infectious disease. You know, you want to treat the people who are sick early on before you've developed the drugs and the vaccines. Um, but how do you know that those things work unless you study them in a rigorous fashion? Um, so, you know, it, it's an ethical issue that, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's ever going to be resolved, but, you know, there's, there's, uh, I would say, um, strong opinions on either side of the debate. And, you know, it's, it's something that will probably continue to um, manifest itself with every emerging infectious disease. Uh, and so, you know, it took a huge village to um, run this program. So uh, this is sort of the, um, the gang um, who helped um, get all those 400 and some patients treated. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you.